Hi there, my name's Kat uh, and I'm Director of Education and Research at the Chartered College of Teaching. This presentation that I'm going to give is based on a presentation I give quite often, which is all around building a strong professional culture in school, why that matters and what it looks like in practice. But given current context, what I'm also going to be trying to do today is to think about and see what that might mean for how we build a strong professional culture in schools during uh, I'm going to use the phrase school, uh, school closures, but I think we all accept that it's not quite closures that we're experiencing. A fairly obvious place to start, I suppose, is why it's so important that, that we help our teachers to be the best that they can be. We know that teaching quality is the biggest uh, thing that we can control within our schools, the most important factor that can affect student achievement, student attainment. This is from a Sutton Trust report that I'm showing on the screen here. Um, we know that this is also particularly true for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. The difference that teachers make and the quality of teaching that those children receive is hugely, hugely important. So clearly we need to be focused on thinking about the quality of teaching. And that means focusing on thinking about teacher effectiveness, about teacher development and about making our schools and therefore our teachers the best that they can be. One of the most interesting pieces of research I've read in recent years is from 2014, and it's from two American researchers, Kraft and Pape, who were looking at this question of how teachers get better over time. And one of the things that you can see from this, this graph here, it's probably pretty unsurprising, um, is that teachers get better, they get more effective, um, the value added for their pupils increases with, with years of experience, certainly in the very early years of their career. You can see sort of naught to three years. There's a fairly steep curve there. Probably not a surprise to any of us that there's a steep learning curve at the beginning of your teaching career that actually from that moment you first step foot, set foot in a classroom and think, hmm, not quite sure what I'm doing here. Through those early years when you're starting to have your own class, you really feel like you're responsible for it. You're practicing things for the first time and then you're trying them again and again, that you are really becoming more effective all the time. Um, it's worth just uh, highlighting that this particular study was looking at maths outcomes uh, and teacher effects on those. Um, but then once you get past about kind of year three, it starts to flatten out a bit here on average. And we can see that there's a little bit of an increase over time, but not a huge increase in effectiveness beyond those very early years of teachers' careers. Um, but one of the interesting things is that this data and this graph, uh, when it looks at the sort of average uh, relationship between teacher experience and effectiveness, it hides quite a lot of variation. And that's not variation based on individual teachers. It seems to be variation depending on the schools that those teachers are in. So if we look at schools which are, are rated as having a strong professional environment, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, it seems that teachers in those schools continue to increase uh, in effectiveness at a higher rate than, than average. And um, as you'd expect, schools with a weaker professional environment, you can see that here on the screen now, tend to plateau. You can really see there's not a great deal of increase at all in teacher effectiveness over time uh, for, for teachers in those weaker professional environments. So this really highlights, I think, why a professional environment seems to matter and why a strong professional environment seems to matter. Kraft and Pape describe a strong professional environment uh, in a number of ways. So they looked to identify what were the features of those schools where teachers seem to continue getting better. I don't think this list is going to be a massive surprise to anyone. The idea of consistently enforced rules around behaviour, time and resource for teachers to engage in professional development, there being a culture of trust and respect and of openness within the school, a clear commitment at the heart of everything to student achievement, opportunities for teachers to engage in collaboration with their peers and Finally, any teacher evaluation that takes place being focused on improving the quality of teaching, not on anything else. It's also worth saying, of course, that when I present this usually to a, a room full of teachers, I think there's a lot of, well, hardly that's hardly rocket science, is it? I don't think I know any teachers or school leaders who wouldn't want this for their school. And yet, of course, we do see scenarios where this isn't necessarily the case. Um, we do see schools, for example, where uh, the approaches to kind of monitoring and accountability uh, seem not quite what we would hope for in terms of a culture of trust. We see teacher evaluation not really seeming to be focused on improving the quality of teaching. Um, we see a limit to the amount of peer collaboration that there's opportunity for. And we can sometimes not see a great deal being invested in time, resources, professional development. Equally, also, again, sometimes uh, 
the rules around behaviour and the way in which those are applied are not always consistent. So although we might all see this as a goal, there are a whole number of reasons they might not be the case. I think, again, in the vast majority of cases, these are exactly what leaders want to have, but there can be a, a huge range of other pressures that are influencing why these don't necessarily exist. These, of course, are in a normal time, in normal school environment, but I think they do have particular implications now as well. And I think the way in which people react in the kind of crisis situation that we're in at the moment is is perhaps sometimes um, almost a sort of even stronger version of what we see in normality. So these things around, for example, um, trust and autonomy that, that seem to be something that's really important here, we're seeing in many cases, but I have also seen examples of teachers being asked to account for everything that they're doing every minute of their day, um, things like uh, quality of their online learning being judged within the first week in which they're trying to uh, provide for an online learning scenario. And again, I think this is driven in many cases by school leaders being worried about not doing the right things. But perhaps this is quite concerning if we want to ensure that our teachers are doing the best job that they can. It's certainly not something that we really want to see happening. Um, I've tried to think about how all of these things relate, because, of course, that's just a, a list of different features. But using that research and then looking more widely at different research, I've tried to understand the relationship between these factors and what these might look like in practice. And the way that I've currently conceptualised it is that there are probably three foundational items that sit underneath everything else. And frankly, if they're not in place, no matter what you do around anything else, you're not going to see the sort of professional environment where your teachers improve and are able to produce the best outcomes for children and young people. Those three things are the behaviour policies, the trust and autonomy uh, for our teachers and that commitment to student achievement. Behaviour policies, I think, is a really important one. What Kraft and Pape weren't looking at here was the approach to behaviour management, but just this question of consistency. And that is something that comes up a lot, that of course, if you have consistency in approach and there are very clear lines of expectation that all pupils and all teachers follow, that does make these things easier to handle. And I think, again, all of us would have from our experience in the classroom, the realisation that if you haven't got the right uh, approaches to behaviour, if you haven't got strong behaviour across the school. It's impossible to start worrying about the quality of your teaching and learning when you're spending half of your lessons trying to sort out issues with pupil behaviour. So that's absolutely key. Um, in a way, again, I see this, as I've mentioned, as being the kind of foundations. Um, this is a bit of a, a joke on Maslow's hierarchy. I think Wi-Fi even more important now than ever. Uh, but, um, but all of these things that actually we need these really key foundations in our school before we can move on to anything else. And that's where behaviour is for me, that without that, nothing else that we do in the classroom is going to be as effective as it could or should be. The other point that I mentioned, or one of the other points that I mentioned, was this commitment to student achievement. Um, I think that's really important for a number of reasons. And I think it's worth highlighting, particularly in, again, the kind of current context, that this isn't just about, uh, about pupil outcomes in exams or in uh, standardised tests. It's about students achieving everything they're able to. It's about the much wider student outcomes in terms of their well-being, their love of learning and everything else. But that that needs to be at the heart. The student outcomes need to be at the heart rather than perhaps being concerned about external measures, accountability and things like that. I think this is critically important in terms of teachers, because if we look at things like the uh, LKM Co report for Pearson, LKM Co are now the um, Centre for Education and Youth. They had a report a few years ago looking at why teachers came into the profession. It's called Why Teach? And um, Making a difference, wanting to make a difference, was one of the main reasons that both primary and secondary teachers chose to join the profession, which, of course, if you then go into your school and you don't feel that you're having a chance to make a difference, you don't feel that you're achieving what you wanted to by becoming a teacher, that's likely to put you off wanting to stay. But there is also a balance point here. We know that teachers need to maintain a healthy detachment and to be able to maintain a sort of work-life balance. I know some people don't like that phrase, but if they're going to be able to do their job well, there's some interesting work by uh, Klusman and colleagues looking at this and kind of looking at sort of teacher types in, in terms of their engagement with the role, but also their ability to detach. And those who are hugely engaged in their role but aren't able to detach tended to burn out very quickly because it's not sustainable across a career. You have to be able to detach and recognise the things that you can't change and the things that you can't be responsible for. 
There's also something interesting in terms of workload here that actually um, we know that workload is a real problem in teaching. We know it's one of the main drivers for teachers leaving the profession, but it's a bit more complicated than just saying it's the amount of workload. Um, work from researchers like Sam Sims found that it wasn't just the number of hours or it wasn't the number of hours that teachers work that seemed to be influencing their job satisfaction. Some reported working higher hours uh, whilst also reporting higher levels of job satisfaction, some lower hours, but still lower job satisfaction. It was to do with how manageable they felt that workload was. Um, and that was to do with the resources and support that they had. But wider conversation also seems to suggest that it's to do with the nature of the workload, that what seems to lead to sort of burnout and a lack of job satisfaction is a sense that what you're being asked to do is making no difference to student achievement, that it's being done uh, for the sake of paperwork, that it's bureaucratic, um, that it's because your senior leaders want to monitor what you're doing and it's not making a difference for pupil outcomes. So that what that workload is about is really, really key here. And that links quite interestingly to some more recent research by uh, by NFER where and uh, working with the Teach Development Trust, where Jack Worth and his colleague looked at teacher autonomy. Um, they had some really interesting findings. It's quite a long report, but I would definitely recommend reading it. And uh, we've also got a shorter article written by Jack Worth in our forthcoming issue of Chartered College Impact. Um, and they found various things that, again, teacher autonomy seemed to be cor correlated with the manageability of workloads. So where teachers felt they had higher autonomy, um, they felt their workload was more manageable. That seems to me to link back to this idea that, uh, that if you're doing things that feel worthwhile, they feel more manageable. Um, it also seemed to correlate with job satisfaction and teachers' intention to stay in the profession. One of the areas that was particularly important was this sense of autonomy over professional development goals. So uh, really the, the sense that they could choose what they wanted to be learning about. They had access to professional development rather than uh, that always being set centrally. It was also interesting that teachers seemed to have less autonomy than in similar professions. And um, there was something interesting about how teacher autonomy changed or didn't change across teachers' careers in that, uh, as you might expect, early career teachers seem to have less autonomy and leaders seem to have more. But actually, between those, um, whilst you were a classroom teacher, there didn't seem to be much change with experience. So a highly experienced classroom teacher didn't seem to report being much more autonomous than a less experienced classroom teacher. Of course, um, this is all based on sort of self-report and so therefore perceived autonomy. And there's an interesting and important point, I think, that it's possible that actually it's also to do with the alignment of what you want and your values as a teacher with that of your school and your employer. Because if you feel that you're able to do what you want to, you might feel that you have a higher level of autonomy than than actually in reality you do. And if there's a, a conflict between how you think something should be handled and how it's actually handled in your school, that's likely to sort of lead rise to your realisation that you have limited autonomy over that. So there are some complexities behind this as well. But the idea of teacher autonomy, the idea of trust is so critical. And I think especially in, in these times, um, it's a real shift for all of us. Many teachers not being in the classroom every day, um, a whole new approach to teaching and learning. And again, that can lead to some undesirable, undesirable behaviours in terms of wanting to feel like uh, like we're in control of what teachers are doing at all times. But this trusting and autonomy of teachers is so, so key now, I think. Teachers have enough pressures without needing to uh, feel that they're having to justify their existence at every moment of the day. So once we've got those three sort of foundational aspects in place, there are things that we can start to do that build on those. Um, and I think those are really um, teacher evaluation, which I've put as the sort of next layer up, because if you haven't got a trustful system, if you haven't got a sense that your teachers feel autonomous, then any sort of teacher evaluation is likely to feel high pressure, high risk and not have the sort of impact um, that we've talked about, which is that we want it to be about improving the quality of teaching. That trust has to be there before that. We also want to be making sure that we've got high quality professional learning opportunities. Um, and opportunities for teachers to collaborate. But again, just to highlight, putting these things in on their own without first working on the culture around behaviour, around trust and around that sort of central focus on student achievement. These are doomed to fail if we haven't got that in place first. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about professional development because um, I think it's probably one of the areas that's most widely covered and professional development standards, I'm sure, from the, the DfE will be very familiar to all of you. Um, but of course, these are things to be thinking about. 
One thing I did want to pick up on, which I think again is particularly interesting in the current climate, is um, this idea of professional development needing to meet needs. This builds a bit on the idea from uh, the NFER report on teacher autonomy that actually this sense of choice over your professional development goals, this sense of it being related to you as an individual, not just generic, everyone in our school needs to learn this because it's in the school development plan, uh, I think is so important. Um, there's a, a few bits of research that highlight the importance of it being matched to teacher needs if we're looking at influencing student outcomes. Um, Philip Accordingly and colleagues report highlighted that, of course, it does also need to meet the needs of schools. And that interaction between the needs of individual teachers and the needs of the school is really key. There's a, an important conversation to be had there. One thing that I read um, from Dylan William a couple of years ago that I thought was quite an interesting idea was that actually also rather than it being matched to teacher needs in the sense of identifying, OK, here's a weakness that I have as a teacher or here's a weakness that I've identified for you as a teacher. Um, it being about actually maybe there's there's something more powerful about teachers becoming more expert in their areas of strength rather than focusing on areas of weakness and always trying to kind of fill gaps. Can we help them to get even better at something that they're already good at? Um, and Antonu and Kiria Kides have suggested that in order to therefore have um, effective CPD, we need to understand where teachers are at and tailor the CPD to what they need to develop to the next level. Um, developmental teacher evaluation, again, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, luckily, I think we're seeing very little in terms of schools now choosing to grade individual lessons, but it's still not unheard of. Rob Coe's work around this is particularly interesting and important, highlighting how inaccurate any attempt to uh, to grade an individual lesson on a sort of four point scale is likely to be and that really you might as well toss a coin. Um, but the high, what we're talking about here is this idea of, you know, teacher observation, teacher evaluation, all being about uh, improving uh, improving teaching quality, about supporting people to move forwards. Um, there's lots of ways in which we will carry out teacher evaluation other than just observation. But just given uh, the amount of time available, I'm thinking mostly about observation here. Um, it's also important to, to note that kind of getting the relationship right between lesson observations and performance management can be quite hard. There's been a few attempts to sort of try different ways of separating out a sense of observation, which should be formative and supportive and helping teachers to move forwards from uh, a sense of performance management. And that's included things like um, obviously making sure that it's not your line manager carrying out the observation, um, even trying people externally carrying out observations. Uh, but what research suggests there is that no matter what the model is, it's very hard for, first of all, for the teacher being observed not to feel that it's going to be linked in some way to performance management, but also um, genuinely for it not to be related to that in some way for, for there to be a sense of kind of um, sharing of observations and things like that within school. So it's pretty difficult to get that right. Uh, one approach that I thought that was quite interesting around teacher observation um, that David Didow wrote about in a blog a couple of years ago was, um, I think he was thinking particularly about sort of Ofsted lesson observations, but how they might work as being almost a sort of starting point for a conversation where rather than uh, just a lesson being watched and then some sort of general discussion afterwards, there would be a conversation afterwards where the teacher would talk about why they took the approaches they did, why they uh, why they did what they did at particular points. And that kind of professional conversation where teachers are being encouraged to articulate and demonstrate their expertise and they're being, again, trusted to know what's right for their classes um, could potentially be really powerful. I really like that idea and I'd, I'd recommend having a look at that blog. One of the most interesting things, again, that I think... Um, we see in this work around strong professional culture is this word collaboration, which um, which gets bandied around quite a lot, it's fair to say. Um, and it can mean quite a lot of different things, I think, from, from people feeling, oh, yes, we do collaboration well, that they've got people working together or that they actually just they're making time for teachers to spend time together. It could be lots of different things. Um, there's a few pointers that we can gather from research about how collaboration might work, particularly um, Interestingly, so I was interested, first of all, in work from James Spillane and colleagues in the US, which they were looking at um, how teachers or who teachers ask for advice in schools in the US. And I think what, what we'd mostly expect would be that 
teachers probably have an idea of who their most effective colleagues are. And so if they want advice and information, they might go to them. But interestingly, in this piece of research, what, what Spillane and his colleagues found was that actually the highly effective teachers were the ones that were doing most of the seeking of advice and information. They were the ones that were going and talking to others more frequently. And I think there's something, a really important point there really about being willing to learn from others, being willing to discuss things, always seeking to develop seems to be really related there to um, to our effectiveness as practitioners. Also, again, research from the US found that uh, working alongside highly effective colleagues accelerated the rate um, at which teachers own effectiveness grew. And that was particularly true for teachers early in their career. So being in a, a really highly effective department starts to help you become more effective, probably not surprising, but important, I think. Um, again, James Spilling, another piece of work, found that working through peers and, and through uh, sort of champions could be a really effective ways of cha way of changing teachers' beliefs and instructional practices. They looked at um, approaches to mathematics instruction and how that could kind of be cascaded through champions. Um, so that might be quite helpful if we're thinking in our school about how we introduce new approaches, how we change culture, how we change practices. Of course, there are very specific um, approaches to collaboration rather than these vaguer ones that we've been talking about, like instructional coaching, which has consistent evidence of impact um, on pupil outcomes, which relatively few pieces of professional development do. So that's one very specific approach that we might want to be looking at. Um, but one kind of word of warning from Rob Coe and colleagues was that one of the challenges in a move towards a more kind of collaborative in school um, professional development approach, which is really powerful in many ways, rather than seeking to send people on one day courses all the time, is that making sure there's sufficient challenge involved is really important too. Um, because otherwise you've got this risk that actually you're just continuing to embed existing practices. There's nothing saying, well, what if the way that we're doing it isn't the best way to do it? So I think that's important too. Once you've got those sort of three things in place, then I think we start to move into a bit of a cycle um, of, of kind of uh, a sort of positive cycle, I think, for our individual teachers. We, we start to see teachers who are, have got high levels of job satisfaction. And that's obviously also related to retention. Those two things, in fact, are very closely related, partly because the questions that are often used in surveys to identify job satisfaction include things like, are you thinking about leaving your job? Um, which obviously are very similar questions to those that are used to understand retention. Um, but there's a few things to just pick out here. So from NFER research from a couple of years ago, uh, we can see that this, this actually was part of a, a big debate around whether um, teacher pay matters, that often it's found that when teachers leave the teaching profession, they, they take a pay cut. So that has, in some cases, sort of been used as an argument that um, that it's not pay, that pay doesn't matter. But actually, I think that it's the relationship between pay, workload, and job satisfaction. It's again, it's much more complicated than that. And what you can see in this graph is just um, how satisfied teachers felt while teaching and then after leaving teaching in their job. So you can see that that naught line in the middle there is when they leave teaching. And, and you can see a pretty dramatic change there in how satisfied they report being in their jobs after teaching. So this job satisfaction question is really, really important in terms of retention in the teaching profession. Um, Sam Sims did some analysis of TALIS data a few years ago, and uh, this was looking at what seemed to be related to teacher job satisfaction. Again, unsurprising, um, but also comforting that these things relate very closely, I think, to what Kraft and Pape found in a, a strong school environment, the ideas of cooperation or collaboration, um, professional development, discipline, feedback, workload, uh, but also um, strong leadership and opportunity, opportunities for progression seem to be important there in, in supporting teacher job satisfaction. Now, we already know that uh, these things relate through to effectiveness. And I want to talk briefly also about the relationship between effectiveness and self-efficacy. Um, so as we've looked at the very beginning of this, we know that in the right environments, teachers, uh, as they get more experience, do become more effective. So if we can retain teachers um, and they're in strong environments, we're going to see them becoming more effective, that's going to lead to better pupil outcomes. But there's also this interesting relationship between effectiveness and self-efficacy that I think brings things back round in a bit of a loop. So um, 
self-efficacy is this sense of how how effective we are, our sense of how good a job we're able to do. Remember that when we what we talked earlier about uh, reasons that teachers join the profession, and one of those was thinking you can make a difference. Another one was a sense that you'd be good at it. So I think teachers feeling that they're doing a good job is really key here. Um, some research from quite a while ago now, from 2001, did find that more effective teachers tend to have greater self-efficacy. Um, and looking at that research and other research, it's quite interesting to try and determine whether that's because uh, teachers know how good or otherwise they are at their job. Is it a sort of simple, if you're good at your job, you know, so you have greater self-efficacy. Um, that's probably the case. But also there is a bit of a sense of having confidence, having greater self-efficacy seems to feed back into your effectiveness. Um, and we know that self-efficacy, a sense of being good at your job, is linked into job satisfaction and again in, in retention rates. So we see these things coming round in a cycle. But what's quite important, I think, is that it's not just about individuals here. We've talked about collaboration already, but this sense of being satisfied, this sense of wanting to stay in a school, and particularly this sense of how effective you are um, and your sense of self-efficacy are not just about you as an individual. They're about how your environment feels, about how your department or your year group feel, about how your school feel. Um, uh, Daniel Murs now at Ofsted and, uh, and his colleague Reynolds wrote about this in their book, this idea that a sense of self-efficacy is not just individual, it's collective. And of course, if we're then focusing on approaches to CPD that might be collaborative, we know that's one of the PD standards, we're helping to develop the expertise of the individual, the confidence of the individual, but also the collective. And that's why I think a lot of these kind of collaborative approaches that we're seeing increasing interest in are really important. Dylan William, for example, suggests that we need to have regular sustained time, at least an hour a month for teachers to meet and work together on their practice if we want to see real improvement. There's lots of different models that are similar to that from uh, sort of teacher professional development groups, journal clubs, uh, different sorts of reading clubs. And that's all of this is quite interesting, I think, in the current time, because of course, you might feel like quite an effective teacher on the ground day to day doing a job that you're very comfortable with. But teachers are all being suddenly pulled out of that environment into often a sort of approach they're not that comfortable or experienced with. And that can be really, really uncomfortable for our teachers. So we need to be looking at how we support that um, individuals, but also taking this point of, of kind of the collective environment, thinking about how are we reassuring our schools that we're doing a good job, that we're doing the best that we can in challenging situations? And how are we ensuring that we're still having these sustained times, these opportunities for collaboration and discussion? Journal clubs and book clubs, reading groups can work really well online. Um, there's actually uh, a couple of articles and guidance uh, documents on those on the Charter College website um, in our COVID-19 resources, which are worth having a look at, because it is really important that we, we make sure teachers continue to be connected. Teaching is a strange job at the best of times when you spend most of your day with 30 children staring at you, but not necessarily that much time with adults and moving away from having uh, even the sort of break and lunch and after school times together, as, as we're seeing a lot of the time at the moment, making sure those those opportunities to connect, to collaborate, to um, to just feel part of a, a collective whole that's doing a good job is really important, I think. Of course, that goes again one layer further that it's not just about schools or departments, collective effectiveness and self-efficacy. It's all of these things exist in a wider education system that if we have an education system that has um, punitive accountability measures that put pressure on schools to do things that don't seem particularly helpful in terms of workload, of course, that's going to lead to uh, to practices in schools that we don't want to see into reduction in job satisfaction. But conversely, if we have the right policies around professional learning, around workload and everything else in the wider system, we have the right setups for that, then we start to see these things being much easier to do in schools. So we can't look at any of these at uh, just a single level. And really, I think that's hopefully where or where we'd like the Charter College to be coming in, along with a whole range of other organisations in the system to ensure that we are building a wider education system that allows for all of these things to take place. Um, if you want to read more about any of the research that I've talked about here around school culture, uh, there's a, a web link there which will take you just to a reading list that I've produced. I think most of the articles that I mentioned there should be in there and lots more besides. There's uh, research, there's blogs, there's examples of practice from schools. And also of particular interest might be a free CPD report that we published on um, teacher CPD. That's got lots of international examples, articles from uh, internationally renowned, renowned academics and practitioners in the field. Um, that's free to download on our website. Um, and I hope that you'll find that interesting. 
just to give a little bit uh, more background about us, the Chartered College of Teaching is the professional body for teachers um, in the UK, but also working with teachers worldwide in international schools and beyond. Um, we're all about celebrating and supporting and connecting our teachers to make sure that they're able to develop and have job satisfaction, all of the things that I've been talking about to ultimately benefit pupils and society. And a big part of that is about thinking about the status of teaching profession. And one of the things that I think has been positive over the last few weeks, if anything positive can be taken from this, is the recognition that of, of the role that teachers play and of how critical and how important they are. Um, have a look, uh, ITV have been showing messages of thank you to teachers thank yous to teachers which I think um, really start to show the celebration that is happening there and I think happens much of the time anyway but sometimes very quietly. Um, there's a few things on the screen here just highlighting some of the things that we're aiming to do and as a member you get access to a whole range of different things but again because lots of these are uh, sort of freely available whether you're a member or not and a lot of them link to what we're talking about here we have uh, print and online copies of our journal you can see that at impact.chartered.college which has a huge range of articles from teachers academics uh, school leaders um, and sometimes also our schools that partner with other professions where we're looking at links between our profession and other professions, including the medical profession. We also have a whole range of shorter articles, things like compact guides that are just one page introductions to key principles and practices uh, through to um, extensive case studies and video case studies from schools showing what some of these things look like. Um, we run events during usual times. Those are face to face uh, regional events during uh, the current situation. We're doing a lot more online. We publish things to support people in running, again, face to face sometimes but currently more online reading groups we have cpd packs we have all sorts of opportunities to contribute to and uh, be engaged with uh, policy at a national level and really seeking to connect teachers across the country um, if you want to know more you can find out more on our website or do get in touch with me thank you very much and i hope you have a great rest of the day